Chapter 1. The God Question The world is a very religious place, and the much-heralded renaissance of scepticism, dubbed the New Atheism, is unlikely to change things. An important minority of Westerners identify as atheists, but it is much smaller than the publicity suggests. The last World Values Survey, 2005-06, the most reliable data set available, found that 10.4% of Britons, 9.9% of Australians, 7% of New Zealanders and 3.6% of Americans accept the tag atheist. And even these numbers may be inflated. In 2008, Olivera Petrovic, an expert in the psychology of religion at the University of Oxford in the UK, caused a stir by presenting empirical evidence that infants naturally incline toward belief in some kind of creator. Atheism, in other words, is not the default position. More relevantly, in a recent interview for the Centre for Public Christianity, CPX, she outlined research revealing that respondents describing themselves as atheist in surveys do not necessarily deny the existence of God. A significant proportion of them admit in post-survey analysis that the tag atheist functions more as a protest against formal religion than a description of their disbelief in any kind of God. Openness to the divine is more dogged, and widespread than we sometimes realise. Even in my own country, which has often been described as the first post-Christian society in the world, surveys continue to reveal very high levels of spiritual and specifically Christian belief. 68% of Australians believe in a God or a universal spirit, and 63% believe in the possibility of miracles today. Slightly more than that, 75.9% believe that Jesus himself performed miracles while only 6% think he never existed. Most surprising for those of us who live in this supposedly godless country, when asked to rate out of 10 how important is God in your life, one being not important at all and 10 being very important, 57.4% of Australians selected 6 and above. 28% selected 10. Despite the fact that atheist writers such as Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens are on the best-seller lists worldwide, the larger point remains. The world is a very religious place. For most people throughout most of human history, the stunningly rational universe we see out there and the uncannily rational mind we experience within suggests the existence of some kind of divinity or deus responsible for this reality. I'll discuss in a moment whether this deus is an impersonal mind or a personal god involved in the affairs of the world. Perceiving God I am not trying to prove the existence of the deus or god. This is not that sort of book, nor do I think it is really possible. Frankly, I am trying to get the god question out of the way so I can focus on the history and relevance of Jesus. I offer these comments simply to point to the near-universal human belief in some kind of divinity. Put simply, most of us perceive in the physical world and in ourselves a larger intention. The whole thing seems arranged, not accidental, created, not a product of chance. And so we imagine there must be a creator. The ancient Hebrew poet describes the sentiment well. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they display knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. The same point was made by St. Paul in his hugely influential epistle to the Romans. Since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made. Belief in God, in other words, is not a deduction people make only after analysing evidence and weighing arguments. It is far more basic, more instinctive. It is something most of us perceive directly by living in a world that seems strangely rational in the way it is put together. This is not to deny that countless professional philosophers go beyond this intuition to provide sophisticated arguments for belief in God. All I'm saying here is that the perception seems to be a fundamental thing for most of us, which is probably why infants, whether in Britain or Japan, where Dr. Petrovich did her comparative research, work out themselves that the world was made by someone. I realise that some people do not perceive these things. 
I'm not sure I have an adequate explanation for this other than to point out that some of humanity's other grand ideas also sometimes go unacknowledged. Some people dislike music, for instance, and others hate art. I cannot explain this. Plenty of people are anarchists, too. They honestly believe that cultural mores, ethical standards and systems of government are bad things, mere inventions that hinder human flourishing. I puzzle over why they do not perceive the truth and beauty found in some form of rule. I am not suggesting a connection here between atheism and anarchism, or between atheism and disdain of the arts. I am just observing that some ideas can be fabulously compelling to most thinking people, and not at all obvious to a minority of equally thoughtful people. Intellectually, I puzzle over atheism just as I puzzle over anarchism and aartism. At this point, my atheist friends like to throw in a favourite rhetorical flourish. You Christians reject all the gods of history except one. We atheists just deny one god more. The suggestion here is that when Christians reflect on why they reject Zeus, Ra, Isis, Vishnu et al., they will come to see the good sense of the atheist who simply adds one more deity to the rubbish bin. This is cute and repeated surprisingly often, but a moment's thought shows it to be rather silly. For one thing, Believers in any particular religion do not reject other gods in toto. They deny only the particular manifestations and stories of the other deities. A Christian, for instance, can happily acknowledge the wisdom of the ancient Egyptians or Indians in positing the existence of a powerful intelligence that orders the universe, whether Ra or Vishnu, and then beg to differ with these ancient cultures when it comes to the elaborations and add-on characteristics of these particular gods. There is an irreducible conviction shared by all worshippers. The rational order of the universe is best explained by the existence of an almighty mind or minds behind it all. Atheists, then, are simply wrong to liken their rejection of all divinity to a Christian's rejection of particular versions of divinity. The analogy of marriage might help. True, I have rejected all other potential spouses in favour of my darling Buff, but this does not mean I have rejected the idea at the core of everyone else's marriage. It would be a rather zealous celibate who ventured to say, when you consider why you reject Amelia, Michelle and Heather, the wives of some of my colleagues at CPX, then you will see the good sense of rejecting marriage altogether. We celibates just go one partner further. As if the difference between committed monogamy and deliberate celibacy is one of degree. There is a huge difference between my rejection of particular marriage partners and the celibate's rejection of marriage itself. There is an equally large difference between a Christian's denial of particular manifestations of the divine and an atheist's rejection of divinity itself. It will take more than neat rhetorical flourishes to undermine the tenacious, near-universal conviction that there must be some kind of deus behind our world. Common Sense Deism where believers of various faiths part ways is in the particularization of the deus. While I can happily endorse the logic behind a deity like Vishnu, that a powerful, intelligent being preserves the universe, I cannot see a good reason to believe, for example, that Vishnu appeared as the avatar Krishna to Prince Arjuna on the eve of his great battle with the Kauravas to strengthen him and disclose the paths of salvation. This story comes from the Bhagavad Gita, and unless I already accept the authority of this sacred Hindu text, I fail to see how I can accept its claims as true. The story doesn't provide a unique answer to any outstanding philosophical question, so its explanatory power is limited. Nor is there any historical data confirming Arjuna's visitation, or his battle, or even his existence. I am left with no reason to accept this particular manifestation of divinity, even though I concur with my Hindu friends that there must be some mighty, preserving being behind the universe. On the reality of a deus, we agree, but as we start telling stories about this being, we go our separate ways. This is probably the place to flag the philosophical distinction between deism and theism. Deism accepts that there is a powerful mind behind the universe, but it stops short of saying anything descriptive about that deus. A soft deist would simply plead ignorance about the personal qualities of the deus. A hard deist would insist the deus has no personal qualities as such. People who say they believe in a universal spirit probably fall into this latter category. Theism, on the other hand, from the Greek word for God, theos, 
is deism plus. It accepts the core conviction of deism that behind the rational world lies a rational mind. But it goes further, insisting that some things can be said about the deus. In a sense, religions begin with the assumption of deism and then move beyond it to theism as they start talking about the deus as benevolent, righteous, or angry, or that it has spoken in some sacred text, or that it has revealed itself in history, or that it can hear our prayers, and so on. Here, the deus is thought of not in impersonal terms, but as a thinking, personal theos. With all due respect to committed atheists, it seems to me that deism is the only responsible conclusion one can draw from simply pondering the uncannily rational nature of the universe. Whether the deus cares for us, what its moral views are, whether it hears our prayers, whether it guides human history, i.e., whether the deus is a theos, are second-order questions that lie beyond simple rational observation of the physical world. Please don't misunderstand me. Personally, I am a theist, not just a deist. But I will happily acknowledge that my theism rests not on rational observation of the physical world, but on other factors I will discuss in a moment. What I am saying is that thoughtful reflection on the origin and nature of existence will lead you only as far as deism, i.e., to the conviction that behind the orderliness of nature and the corresponding rationality of the human mind must lie some immense mind. Albert Einstein was a deist, so far as we can tell from his own statements and from those who knew him. He rejected both theism and atheism, preferring to acknowledge some kind of eternal spirit whose rational nature was imprinted on the physical universe, he frequently used the word God, but only in this nebulous, theistic sense. Other famous physicists, such as Professor Paul Davies of Arizona State University, formerly of Australia, also admit to something like deistic views. Davies even wrote a book called The Mind of God, in which he openly discussed his conviction that the order of the world, and in particular, the emergence of our own rational minds, cannot have been an accident, but were in some meaningful way intended. I sometimes wonder if even the avowed atheist Richard Dawkins is sympathetic to some form of deism. My title, The God Delusion, he writes, does not refer to the God of Einstein and the other enlightened scientists of the previous section. In the rest of this book, I am talking only about supernatural gods. Einstein was critical of atheism just as he was critical of personal theism, so I am left wondering what exactly Dawkins is approving and disapproving of here. Whatever the case, recently an even more influential sceptic than Dawkins moved from atheism to overt deism. Anthony Flew, former professor of philosophy at the University of Kiel and Reading in the UK, and author of a number of important textbooks on philosophical atheism, including God and Philosophy and The Presumption of Atheism, has been as influential among professional philosophers as Dawkins has in the general public. But in 2007, he surprised many by publishing There Is a God, How the World's Most Notorious Atheist Changed His Mind. Actually, Flu stops short of saying he believes in God in the personal sense, but he is clear that the three items of evidence we have considered in this volume, the laws of nature, life with its teleological organization, and the existence of the universe, can only be explained in light of an intelligence that explains both its own existence and that of the world. Christians were jubilant, almost claiming flu as a convert. Atheists were outraged, suggesting the professor's old age had got the better of him. Neither is appropriate. Flew had just joined the common-sense ranks of the vast majority of people throughout history in perceiving that the rationality of the universe and of our own minds can only be explained by the existence of some sort of divinity. Deism is common sense. <laughs>